Look at paragraph 8 of Federalist 76. This is part 3. As you can see, I have uh, put the name of a few of the other professors uh, uh, right there in front of the camera. Uh, make sure you watch all their talks. Read some of their books if you can. Um, tons of their videos are available. That's Gordon Wood, Joseph Ellis, Jack Rakoff, Peter Onuf, Pauline Mayer. Okay, let me continue reading this last part of this paper. To what purpose then require the cooperation of the Senate? I answer that the necessity of their concurrence would have a powerful, though in general, a silent operation. It would be an excellent check upon a spirit of favoritism in the president and would tend greatly to prevent the appointment of unfit characters from state prejudice, from family con connections, from personal attachment, or from a view to popularity. In addition to this, it would be an efficacious source of stability in the administration. See, it's a beautiful way of saying, regardless of who the president is, we know the corruption can happen, and that's why we need the, uh, another small assembly, in this case the Senate, um, to confirm this appointment. Because the president might just choose someone that uh, has no qualifications, but he's just doing it out of a favor, or because there's family connections or things like that. And uh, so he says, this way the Senate can just say no. This person is not competent. We are not going to risk the national security of this country. Now, just keep in mind when he's talking about small body of assembly, a small assembly. Remember when, when the United States actually they united, they ratified the Constitution. Because of 13 states, there were only 26 senators. And as we have said before, there were 65 members to the first Congress of the United States, to the first House of Representatives. So keep these numbers in mind. The next paragraph, it will readily be comprehended that a man who had himself the sole disposition of offices would be governed much more by his private inclinations and interests than when he was bound to submit the propriety of his choice to the discussion and determination of a different and independent body. And that body, an entire branch of the legislature. The possibility of rejection would be a strong motive to care in proposing. The danger to his own reputation and in the case of an elective magistrate to his political existence, from betraying a spirit of favoritism or an unbecoming pursuit of popularity to the observation of a body whose opinion would have great weight in forming that of the public, could not fail to operate as a barrier to the one and to the other. He would be both ashamed and afraid to bring forward for the most distinguished or lucrative stations, candidates who had no other merit than that of coming from the same state to which he particularly belonged, or of being in some way or other personally allied to him, or of possessing the necessary insignificance and pliancy to render them the obsequious instrument of his pleasure. To this reasoning, it has been objected that the president, by the influence of the power of nomination, may secure the complacence of the Senate to his views. This opposition of universal venality in human nature is little less an error in political reasoning than the supposition of universal rectitude. Remember, I told you he was criticizing human beings, he was, he was actually 
stating the fact that human beings are corruptible. He's always been saying this during these papers, especially with power comes possibly corruption. And here he says there are people that are going to talk about all of the Senate becoming, or part of most of the Senate senators becoming corrupt. And he says it is crazy to think that human beings are going to be like that. This supposition of universal venality in human nature is little less an error in political reasoning than the supposition of universal rectitude. Just like you would be wrong to say that all human beings are good, he says it would be wrong to say that they are all bad. The institution of delegated power implies that there is a portion of virtue and honor among mankind which may be a reasonable foundation of confidence. And experience justifies the theory. So we are establishing this government thinking that there is a small percentage of people. He doesn't say it here, but when you read them, that's what they say. So small, small, very small percentage of people that will be virtuous enough and will put the good of their country before their own self-interest. And these people are wise, they have to be wise, they have to be well-informed, they have to be, uh, have all the right qualifications. And then on top of that, put the interest of the country above the personal interest or partisan interest. If you were to read what, what Hamilton and Madison really believed, they probably believed that maybe 1% of people would qualify. They don't come and say it, but they, uh, they just wanted to have the best. And amongst the best, the ones that were virtuous enough to put the interest of the country ahead. Okay, I'll continue reading. It has been found to exist in the most corrupt periods of the most corrupt governments. The venal venality of the British House of Commons has been long a topic of accusation against that body in the country to which they belong, as well as in this. And it cannot be doubted that the charge is, to a considerable extent, well-founded. But it is as little to be doubted that there is always a large proportion of the body which consists of independent and public-spirited men who have an influential weight in the councils of the nation. Hence it is, the present reign not accepted, that the sense of that body is often seen to control the inclinations of the monarch, both with regard to men and to measures. Though it might therefore be allowable to suppose that the executive might occasionally influence some individuals in the Senate, yet the supposition that he could in general purchase the integrity of the whole body would be forced and improbable. Improbable. A man disposed to view human nature as it is, without either flattering its virtues or exaggerating its vices, will see sufficient ground of confidence in the probity of the Senate. To rest satisfied, not only that it will be impracticable to the executive to corrupt or seduce a majority of its members, but that the necessity of its cooperation in the business of appointments will be considerable and a salutary restraint upon the conduct, conduct of them, that magistrate. Nor is the integrity of the Senate the only reliance. The Constitution has provided some important guards against the danger of executive influence upon the legislative body. It declares that no senator or representative shall, during the time for which he was elected, be appointed to any civil office under the United States, which shall have been created, or the emoluments whereof shall have been increased during such time. And no person holding any office under the United States shall be a member of either house during his continuance in office. Uh, so uh, 
Here are some of the other names that I've already mentioned to you, some of the other books, like this is a collection of essays, of Saving the Revolution, that I uh, think uh, it would be beneficial for you to look at. And of course, as I've spoken before, C-SPAN. C-SPAN is the ultimate source. Library of Congress is excellent. TeachingAmericanHistory.org. Uh, you can look at the text of the Federalist. You can see at the beginning there's a summary. Uh, and many other things can be found there. Many other documents. National Constitution Center. Lots of videos. Lots of... They have an app that could be used. National Archives. There's a book that I've mentioned before. It's called Beyond Confederation. I think it's edited by two or three people. It's a collection of essays. That's an excellent book to read, Beyond Confederation. And I'll write that down for you. I'll show you the book here in the next few videos. Yeah, I cannot emphasize enough the benefits of uh, uh, checking C-SPAN out wonderful books, wonderful talks about books, and uh, especially American history, uh, all the videos they provide, tours of the cities, tours of the national historical places. Uh, if you can't, if you're, if you can't go to those locations because you just don't have the time, you can't afford to, you can't afford to, or you're living overseas, that's the best way of uh, learning about American history.